Hi there, my name is Anya Yakubovich, and I'm so happy to welcome you to Kensington exclusive author event featuring Brooke Adams Law. I am the Director of Community Relations for Kensington Place, Redwood City, North Atherton. We are so excited to welcome many of our Kensington families, prospective families, and also friends to this event. Here at Kensington Place, our promise is to love and honor every resident as if they were our own family. Hugs, laughs, companionship, and resident support are routine parts of our every day. We help our residents feel loved and secure by delivering heartfelt excellence in Alzheimer's and dementia care in a warm and beautiful environment. Kensington Place has eight locations across the country. If you are interested in learning more about Kensington Place Memory Care, please visit our website or call us directly. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce author Brooke Adams Law. Brooke is a writer and writing teacher based in Connecticut. She is the author of the novel Catch Light, which tells the story of the Keene family as they struggle with their mother's diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Catch Light won the Fairfield Book Prize in 2019. Phil Cly, winner of the 2014 National Book Award, called it a beautiful and moving novel. Without further ado, I'll turn things over to her Welcome, Brooke, and thank you so much for being with us today. It is such an honor to be here with all of you tonight. So welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, as Anya said, my name is Brooke Adams Law, and I am a writer and the author of the book Catchlight. And as we start off, I want to just tell you a little bit about how the event is going to roll and then we will jump in and get started. So I am going to share a little bit about my book, Catchlight, and what it's all about. I'm going to share a little bit about how I wrote the book, how I had the idea, um, the story of how it got published, which is a really fun story. Um, we are going to share the Catchlight video trailer, which is a 45 second video spot about the book. We are going to move into Q&A session. So feel free to put at the bottom of your screen, you should have a Q&A box where you can send questions to me and feel free to do that throughout the presentation because I think if you wait to the end, you might forget. So put in the questions as you think of them and then I'm gonna take them all at once towards the end of our time together. And then stick around until the very end because we are giving away three prize packs at the end of the event. And the prize packs include a signed copy of the book, um, a custom Catchlight bookmark. We've got a handwritten note from me and then also a mug from Kensington. So you can enjoy coffee or a cup of tea while you're reading the book. So that's how the event is going to proceed and let's get started. So a little bit about me, as Anya shared, I live in Connecticut, so I have lots of lighting happening because it's very dark here. It's about 9 p.m. Um, I am a mom of two. I have two little ones, Elijah and Jacqueline. They are four and one. So actually the timing is perfect because they are tucked in bed instead of running around screaming, which is their normal state of being. <laughs> I also run my own business as a writing teacher and I coach other writers who are working on books, which is the most fun ever. And right now I am sharing a lot about my book, Catchlight, which releases on October 5th. So we are about T minus three and a half weeks and counting um, and I couldn't be more excited. So I would love to share just a little bit about what Catchlight is about. So it is about a family of four grown siblings. Um, they can't stand to be in the same room together. That may or may not feel familiar to some people. Um, and when their mother is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, they really have this moment of um, having to decide how they are going to come together and care for her. So making all the decisions about her care, making financial decisions. So not just about being able to be in the same room without a fight breaking out, but also about how they as siblings come back into a relationship with each other and also with their mother. So <clears throat> 
The book is narrated actually by two of the siblings. So Laura is the youngest of the four. She's in her early thirties and she's a therapist. So she's always like trying to manage everyone's emotions and help everybody get along. And she's kind of like this model daughter. She's always showing up for brunch with her mom and her stepdad, like every single Sunday, whereas the other siblings like, you know, show up for special occasions, that kind of thing. Um, Laura is also recently divorced. So she kind of has some embarrassment about that. Like as a therapist, she couldn't fix her marriage. And so she's kind of going through some shame about that. Um, the second narrator is James, who's her older brother. And James is such an interesting character because he's the black sheep of the family. He's total alcoholic. Um, and they, the family treats him as a screw up. And he is the screw up, right? But there becomes this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy where they expect very little of him. And so he kind of like meets that very low bar every time. And it becomes a little bit of that self-fulfilling prophecy. So there's a very, in James's journey as a character, there kind of becomes this very stark choice for him where he recognizes that he is either going to keep drinking for the rest of his life or he's going to like quit drinking and get sober and like make something of himself, right? And he comes to a point where he recognizes that no one in his life like cares what he does anymore. And, and he kind of really has to wrestle with that choice, right? Um, so that's kind of the two narrators and what they're dealing with alongside um, this diagnosis they have of their mother's Alzheimer's disease. And as the book goes along, they also come to realize that Catherine, who's their mother, she's losing her memory, that she has a secret that she has never told anyone. And they start to get a glimmer of it, but they have to work with her to kind of get the whole story or else it's going to be forgotten, right? So there's this element of having to figure out this this secret that's going to have an impact on their identity as a family um, and working with Catherine to kind of get the whole story before, before it's lost entirely. So a little bit about how I came up with this idea for this book. So when I was in college, my grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and this was my dad's mom. So on my dad's side of the family, my dad is the middle child. He, he's one of six. So he's got um, three older siblings and two younger. And on that side of the family, I have, I literally had to count earlier today. I have 17 first cousins not including me and my sister. So there's 19 of us in total, 19 grandchildren. Um, and so it's a big family. I grew up in Philadelphia, so it's a big Catholic Philadelphia family. And it was so interesting because when, so when my grandmother was diagnosed, um, I had just gone to college and I went to Vassar College, which is in New York. And it was a little bit unusual because even on that side of the family, everyone lives in Philadelphia. So everyone lives within like a 20 or 30 minute drive of each other. All of my cousins previously had gone to St. Joe's University in Philadelphia or one of my cousins went to UPenn. I think I had one cousin who went to Penn State and it was like, whoa, Penn State is really far away, like, but it's still in Pennsylvania, right? So it was really interesting when I went away to school, there was very much this sense of being a little bit more removed from kind of the day-to-day -day workings of what was happening in our extended family. And so when my grandmother was diagnosed, I kind of watched a little bit more from afar than the rest of my cousins and my uncles and aunts and everything who were kind of right there while it was happening. So, but I was able to see sort of, again, a little bit from this remove how my dad and his siblings had to navigate, you know, deciding how they were going to take care of her, um, making financial decisions, right? So at the time, her retirement savings did not allow for certain levels of care. And so they then had to decide, well, who's going to make those difficult decisions that people in this situation have to deal with, which is like, 
who's going to contribute financially, who gets to make decisions about her care. Like, do we all have to agree? Right. And there are a lot of personalities, of course, kind of engaged in some of these decisions. The other really interesting piece, I think for me was, you know, whenever I came home for breaks or summer or winter break, things like that, I would go with my dad to visit my grandmother and her decline was always so stark to me because it had always been maybe two or three months since I had last seen her. And I think that was really difficult because, you know, my dad saw her maybe four or five times a week. And so to him, her decline was more gradual. Um, but for me, it was always sort of like two or three months, like at a time, sort of like seeing her, um, not remember my name or not remember where she was or be asking about my grandfather who had died many years earlier. Right. And so that pain of kind of like losing each of those pieces of her memory was really stark for me. And again, sort of like seeing it, um, kind of happen in like larger chunks of time was really challenging. So my grandmother passed away from complications due to Alzheimer's disease in January of 2007. And that summer I graduated from college and I came home. I was living at home and this is funny, but so I was an English major in college and as many good liberal arts majors do, I came home and worked at Starbucks and I'm kind of making light of it a little bit. Um, but, and I think at the time I very much recognized like, okay, I'm going to work here and I'm going to live at home until I figure out what my next steps are. And I think there was a little bit of shame around it for me at the time, but honestly, looking back, taking that job and living at home allowed me to have this idea for this book and to start writing. Whereas if I had taken a full-time job right away and been out on my own, I don't think that I would have had the same bandwidth and the same capacity to sort of be daydreaming and kind of imagining this story. So in any case, this is how the story first came about. So I came home and I'm working, living at home, and I was reading a book at the time by Madeline Lengel. So her most famous book is the children's book, uh, Wrinkle in Time. That's the book she's most well known for, but she also has a few adult novels, and one of them is called The Severed Wasp. So it's a, it's a lesser known book of hers. So The Severed Wasp was super interesting to me because in that book, there's an, there's an elderly narrator. I think she's in her 80s. And her name is Catherine. And she, for her whole career, was uh, like a famous concert pianist. So she traveled the world playing the piano in orchestras and recording with all of these famous artists. She lived in Europe for most of her life or her adult life. But when she's in her 80s, she retires from playing professionally and she comes home to New York City, which is where she grew up. And basically she uses this time at the end of her life, like after she's retired, where she's sort of consciously spending time, you know, she plays the piano every day, but she's consciously spending time reflecting on her past and really like making peace with her memories and her experiences. And so the, in the book, there's a lot of flashbacks to like earlier time. And so, for example, she and her husband were actually living abroad in Europe during World War II, and they were both captured by the Nazis at one point. So she has all these memories of being like in a camp. And like, so there's all these things that she is just reflecting on and really kind of moving through her grief and her pain that she has maybe like not processed. So I'm reading this book and I'm thinking about my grandmother and I had this moment of asking myself like, well, who are you without your memory? And what happens at the end of your life if you are not able to, to have this experience where you get to um, process your pain and process your memories, right? Like what does your life become if you don't get to have that period of reflection? 
So I used this question, who are you without your memory? And I started getting glimmers of this family and it's the Keen family. And I actually, um, I named the matriarch of that family, the one who has Alzheimer's disease. I named her Catherine in tribute to the hero, the hero from the severed wasp, who's also named Catherine for in kind of in tribute for having given me the idea for this book. And it's so interesting because as closely as some of my reflections about my grandmother and my dad's family and how they handled her disease were part of how I thought about the book and the story, the story very much and very quickly took on a life of its own, right? So in no way is my fictional Catherine, like she's not my grandmother, right? And the siblings in the book are not my dad and his siblings, but I use their experience and this question of who are we without our memory to jump off and kind of imagine something totally new and imagine how a family in that situation might navigate all of these decisions, which of course, as a 18, 19, 20 year old, I was like not privy to those conversations that my dad and his siblings were having, but I could imagine it, right? And so I spent a lot of time really thinking about what that might have felt like and what that might have looked like. Um, again, in a family where there's a lot of like politics in, in the Keen family that I created and just a lot of sibling rivalry and sibling dynamics, right? And there's a lot of those moments where, you know, they're interacting and they're all adults, but they start fighting as if they're like 10, 11, 12 years old. And I think so many of us can relate to that because that's kind of how families are. <laughs> um, so I've been thinking also about how I think the power of fiction is so essential to us to read stories of families and people who are encountering the things that we may have encountered ourselves. And there's also a piece, right, about encountering the stories of people who are different than us or have had a different experience. And there's also this piece, like I just said, of encountering families and stories and people who are going through something similar to what we may be experiencing or may have experienced in the past. And really sometimes like those stories can just unlock emotions for us that maybe we had to bury or put aside to just like get through whatever we were getting through. And I think fiction and books have the power to kind of let us feel emotions even more deeply than we might on our own. And I've been thinking also about how, especially during this time, during COVID, when so many of us are isolated or are not able to see friends and family in person, it's great that we can connect virtually like this. And also when we are able to connect in with a book and read about characters and see another family come to life, that can make us just feel connected to others who are going through a similar experience, even others, like when we find that humanity in someone, even when they're having a different experience, I think that's really critical as well. And I was super gratified to read um, a newspaper article. This was probably about a year ago that there was an actual psychological study that was done where it was comparing people who frequently read fiction with people who rarely read fiction. And they were finding that people who read fiction are often more compassionate and they can often see like other sides um, than people who don't frequently read fiction. So I felt super gratified because I was like, I've been training for this my whole life, right? Because I've always been a reader. So that was super fun for me. And I think part of what I wanted to do with Catchlight was create a place for families like ours who have lost someone due to Alzheimer's disease or who are watching someone that they love go through this experience right now. For, for those families and those people to feel seen and heard and to have that experience be validated. Because I think that can also help us feel like we're not alone. Even if you don't know anyone in your real life who's having that experience, when you read about someone who is, it can make you feel more connected. I also wanted to share, this was extremely gratifying to me. So when the copy editor who works for my publisher finished copy editing Catchlight. She sent a beautiful email to my editor and she said, she shared that her father 
had gone through Alzheimer's disease and she had recently lost him. And she said that, well, first of all, she shared a little bit of his story, which was really beautiful. And she said that they were so grateful that he actually, his personality didn't change throughout the disease. So even when he didn't remember who they were, he still had like his sunny nature, right? And he was still like very pleasant to be around. And she was saying that like, of course, not everyone has that experience. Like some people's personalities really do change. And she was so grateful for that. But part of what she said was, she said, as the child of someone who has gone through this devastating disease, she said, I really felt that Brooke represented um, that story so beautifully. And she just said, she got it right. And that was so moving to me in such a genuine way, because of course, like I wasn't going through it firsthand, but to hear that when I was able to put my family's experience alongside um, what I could imagine about a family going through that and to hear from someone first who had done it firsthand that, that she felt that I represented it well, just felt like such a triumph to me. So it was really, really moving. A little bit about how I kind of moved through the writing of the book and then we'll talk about the publishing story which is really fun so the first thing I want to offer is <laughs> this book is 13 years in the making so if you heard me say I started I first had the idea in the summer of 2007 and so we're now 13 years later um, Ani was asking me at the beginning she's like I really want to know like kind of like how did it like how did it unfold right and so part yeah it's a little bit like why did it take quite so long is, is the question that a lot of people ask me. So I first had the idea in the summer of 2007 and I spent probably a year and a half or so, maybe two years, like creating a draft. And so during that time, I moved from living at home with my parents to I moved to my first apartment in Washington, D.C. I had my first full time job and on the side, like evenings, weekends, I was writing this book, the book that would become Catchlight. It was not named that at the time. So I was working on this draft and um, I got to the end of it and I really was like, okay, I have a draft of this book and I know that it can be better and I have no idea how to make it better. So I kind of sat with it for a little while and over the next year or two, I got married, I moved twice, right? I switched jobs again when we moved. So there was kind of a lot happening personally. And then in the fall of 2010, I decided to go and get my MFA degree. So it's a master's of fine arts degree in creative writing. And it was so fun because I walked in with like this draft of this book and I was like, I know it can be better. Like, I just want to know how to, how to edit myself and how to make the book better because I don't know what it needs, but I just know it needs something. So I, I walk into my first workshop and I walked out that first day and I thought, I'm going to start over from page one. And I did. I think I had about, I think the original draft was probably 200 or 250 pages. And I just like set it all to the side and I opened a blank Word document on my computer and I started over from page one. And I actually did that again. <laughs> so my program was two years long. And in the second year, I actually started over again from page one because I had like, at that point, I had the vision for exactly where it was gonna go and how I wanted to unfold it. And so started over from scratch twice. I graduated from my program in the winter of 2013. And I would say the next year or year and a half, I really, so at that time I had, our thesis had to be a hundred pages of something really polished. So it was the first hundred pages, again, of the book that would become Catchlight. And the next year, probably the next year or so, I finished the book. So it was probably about 300 pages at that point. And then I was like, okay, I'm ready. We're going to get an agent. We're going to publish. Let's do this, right? So it's 2014. And I proceeded to go like gangbusters, right? So I queried like 125 literary agents. I entered contests. I pitched small presses. I was relentless. I was like, this book is going to come out into the world. And quite frankly, I just heard no after no after no. And also silence after silence after silence. 
And so after a long time, I decided like eyes wide open, I was really like, I'm going to on purpose kind of put catch light back in the drawer for a little while and work on something new because I was spending so much time like researching ways to get it published that I wasn't working on anything new in terms of my own writing. And I was really missing that creative outlet. So I put catch light into a drawer for a little while. I, I started working on some new things and then let's see in the winter of 2019, I thought I'm going to try again for this contest called the Fairfield book prize. And just to be clear, I had already entered it. So the Fairfield book prize runs every two years. So I had entered in 2017 and my book didn't even make the final round. And I just thought like, what do I have to lose? I'm going to enter again. And it's an interesting contest because it's a relatively small pool of people because you have to be either a student or a graduate of the Fairfield University MFA program in order to enter. So it's a relatively smaller pool of applicants than some other contests are. And also, you know, at the same time that like everyone who's entering has a master's degree in creative writing, right? So you know, like every single person in there has had the same amazing mentors as you and has had the same amazing workshops as you. And like their work is in a really good place, right? So in other contests, you might be up against people who have never had anyone read their book, right? They've never gotten any feedback, right? And where you have had two years at a graduate level of like working on something. Um, so while it might be a smaller pool, it's definitely like super competitive, but I decided like, what do I have to lose? Like, let's take a chance and do this. So I found out in the spring of 2019 that Catch Light was a finalist. It was one of six finalists and that they were going to choose a winner um, sometime in the summer. So this part of the story is really hilarious. So um, it was June 19th of 2019. There's a lot of nines in this part of the story. So June 19th of 2019, and I remember the exact date because it was my ninth wedding anniversary and my daughter was nine days old. So she was born June 10th. So this is nine days later, it's June 19th. And I'm like sitting in bed, she's sleeping in the bassinet right next to the bed. And I pulled out my phone and I was like, oh, I need to do this thing. Like I have to go in my email and like get something. Like I wasn't going to check my email. I was just going in to like find something I needed. I can't remember if I was ordering something or like whatever. I needed some information that was in my inbox. And I click open and I have this email from Chris Madden, who was a colleague of mine in the MFA program and now runs Woodhall Press, which is a, a local publisher. And it says Fairfield Book Prize. And I'm like, interesting. So I open it up and he's like, hey, Brooke, I know you just had a baby. And I think you might have missed the email we sent two days ago that Catchlight won the Fairfield Book Prize. So I started bawling my eyes out, um, like so many tears. And my husband comes running in and he was like, what is wrong? And I was like, my book. It's going to come out into the world right after all this time. So it was just this moment of just seeing that this dream that I had had for so many years was going to be fulfilled. And it was just the most exciting day ever. So I got to call family members and tell them and still crying, crying, crying. And, um, we, it was funny because we had already planned to go out to lunch to celebrate our anniversary. And so we got to also celebrate um, that Catch Light would be moving out into the world. Um, so super, super exciting and just so thrilled to be sharing this moment with you when we are about three weeks um, out from the book launch, which is happening October 5th. Catchlight is now available for pre-order. You can pre-order it um, on Barnes and Noble and also on Amazon. So the Kindle version and the paperback version are both available on Amazon. The paperback version is available on Barnes and Noble. And if you're interested in the story, I would love to ask you to pre-order. And tomorrow, Anya is going to send out a follow-up email that will have links to pre-order. 
You can also go look it up right now if you would like. The cool thing about pre-orders is that they really help build buzz for a book and they also signal to the bookseller that they should stock up on copies because come launch day, there's probably gonna be a big influx. So if you're interested, I invite you to pre-order and um, you'll get the book on October 5th, which is the day that it releases and you'll be able to dive right in. So all of that said, we are going to take a minute and show you the Catchlight book trailer. So a book trailer, I had a few people ask me like, what is that? It's exactly like a movie trailer. It's a 45 second video spot that kind of teases interest in a book. So in this case, the Catchlight video trailer is, um, it's the theme is around photography. And the reason for that is that Laura, who is one of the narrators of the book, is an amateur photographer. And it's really interesting. I, it was interesting to me to be able to use this kind of plot device where she picks up her camera again as a way to interact with her mother as her mother is declining. And she kind of uses her camera to document her mother's decline, right? And you can kind of see, she talks about in the book how you can see when Catherine is at home and when she's like not quite there and she's able to document all of it. And one of the things that she says in the book is that taking photos of her mother really allows her to um, be present with her, like whatever's happening in the moment and, and see her mother in a new way. So we used photos in the trailer um, as kind of a tribute to that. And the last thing I wanna say about that was um, when, I went to receive the Fairfield Book Prize. The guest judge was this wonderful writer, Phil Clyde. His book, Redeployment, won the National Book Award in 2014. So it was such an honor for him to choose my book as the winner. And one of the things that he talked about as he was announcing that Catchlight was the winner at the, at the award ceremony was that um, it was a book that asks whether we can make art out of pain and it's a book that shows us how that is done. And it was so gratifying to me because that's what I was trying to do with this book is to show that Laura is using art to make sense out of her pain. And for myself, I was using my writing to make sense out of the pain that I saw around me. So with that, we're gonna play the Catchlight video trailer. So that's the Catchlight trailer, and I just love it the same amount every single time I see it. It makes me feel so excited, and I especially love the music. I feel like it really captures kind of this haunting, atmospheric tone of the book, so love it. Um, before we dive into questions, I'm going to take questions in a few minutes. So if you have questions about the writing process, about the storyline, anything like that, you can pop them in the Q&A. Um, little tile at the bottom of your screen. And before we get there, I wanted to cover one more thing, which is I was talking recently with one of my writing students about how <clears throat> we often, it's so easy when you read a book to think like, oh, the writer had this idea and they sat down and they wrote the book all the way through and then it was over. <laughs> Right? And it's like a total fallacy. So I wanted to give a little bit of behind the scenes about um, what changed in the book as I was writing it, just because it's kind of a little like a little bit of an exclusive flavor of like, it didn't and it didn't start out the way it ended up. Right. And so I just wanted to give a little behind the scenes of some of the things that shifted and some of the things that I learned about the characters and the story as I was writing it. So the first thing was, 
So in the original first draft that I wrote in like 2007, 2008, Laura was the only narrator. And one of my professor mentors kind of very early on said like, why don't you try playing with some other character points of view just to see like what, what comes out. And so that's how I came to James's voice. And right away, I felt that he had a different voice and a different side of the story to tell. And I was able to click into his character like very quickly. And I was like, yes, this is working. This is great. And I also tried Catherine as a point of view character. And it was super challenging, as you might imagine. And I was trying to convey like what her state of mind might have been or like like when she was present when she wasn't and i just felt from the beginning like i couldn't quite make it work and i had been thinking about it because there was another wonderful novel that came out around that time so this may be 2011 or 2012 called Turn of Mind by Alice LaPlante. And that book is, is narrated by a character who has dementia. And it's really well done. It's a literary thriller, so there's a lot of suspense. Um, and it's really well done. And I was trying to emulate that style a little bit. And for me and for this book and the story, it just didn't work. I just could not kind of get a handle on Catherine as like a character who would narrate. Um, and I got a lot of feedback from others as well, but it was like not working at all. So I decided to let it go. And I really felt that showing her from Laura's point of view and James's point of view was really the strongest way to go. So I, I let go of her as a point of view character and just kept the two of them. The other major, major change that I made probably in the middle of my program was originally the book was set in Philadelphia, right? Because part of it was inspired by some of the events that my family had gone through. And one, I remember specifically like one day I was at our, so the, the program that I did was called low residency. And so instead of taking class all semester, we would go twice a year and take class for 10 days, and then everything else would be kind of remote. So we had our residencies on this beautiful island off the coast of Mystic, Connecticut, and it's right on the Long Island Sound. It's the, one of the most beautiful places in the world for me. And I woke up early one morning and I went for a walk, and it was really foggy, so there was like gray mist over the water, and it was very sort of haunting and atmospheric. And I remember I could hear a buoy clanging to like let ships and boats know like where the channel was. And it was kind of echoing off the mist, right? And I just had this moment where I was like, this is the setting for the book, right? It has to be coastal New England. There's this like haunting atmospheric feeling to it. And so I moved the setting of the whole book from Philadelphia to now it's set in coastal Rhode Island. And it really made a huge difference. Like it was a ton of rewriting. It made a huge difference to the story. And now the family home where the Keens live is, well, where Catherine lives at the start of the book is a huge part of the story. And it's right on the ocean. And the ocean actually plays a huge part in the climax of the book. Um, so I'm so glad that I made that change. And also it was one of those moments where you're just like, oh my gosh, this is going to be so much work. And it really was a lot of work, but it was totally worth it in the end. And I'm really glad that I did that. So I wanted to share those two examples just um, to share that part of the writing process for me has really been like staying flexible and staying open to those ideas that are gonna shift gears for me. And that's for me what has made it the strongest book that I could. So with that, we're gonna move into some Q&A time. So I invite you if you have a question to um, pop it in the Q&A. And there's a few questions that have already come in. So I'm gonna start with some of those. Okay, so Tiffany is asking, and I'm just looking to the side, this is where I have my notes in the Q&A. So what in your own life were you able to draw on for each of your narrator's voices? Oh, Tiffany, this is such a good question. Okay, so I think there are some ways in which Laura and I share some personality traits, right? So she's very observant. Um, and she she has this people pleasing quality of like always trying to manage how everybody else is doing. So I can tend to do that as well if I don't kind of rein myself in. So um, so I was able to draw on that a little bit. And she also kind of became her own person. So and it's interesting because 
James is like a completely different character for me. So like, I can honestly say that his voice and his story really kind of came to me from somewhere, right? From inspiration or from like a creative wellspring because immediately, like as soon as I started writing in his voice, I just felt like his voice would almost take me over um, and he would just be like speaking through me. So his voice is very different than me or than anyone I know, but is very strong in his own right. So, all right, another question from Tiffany. If you could have a novel written about one specific memory of your life, what memory would you pick? Oh my gosh, what a fun question. Hmm. All right. So I've always felt like there was a novel here and I don't know what it would be, but it could be interesting. So when I was the summer of my freshman year of college, I picked up and went with a friend on this ridiculous adventure where I went to, when she was growing up, her church did a summer camp in Scotland on the shores of Loch Lomond. And she would go there as a camper every summer. And now that she was in college, she was going back to volunteer as like a counselor. And I like picked up knowing no one there except for her, flew to Scotland. It was the first time I'd ever been out of the country. It was the first time I'd ever traveled on a plane by myself. Well, with without my parents. And I just like showed up at this camp in Scotland on the shores of Loch Lomond and like was volunteering there for probably, I think it was about two and a half weeks that I was there. Um, and it was so much fun and I met some amazing people and I feel like there is like a TV series or a movie or something about that. So who knows, maybe someday. All right, so Laura is asking, were there any parts of the book that were difficult to write? Yes, yes, there were. Um, so I'm gonna share two examples. One is an example that was difficult technically, like technically it was difficult for me to get the narration and just the scene correct. And there's a scene, I'm not gonna share much about it because I don't wanna give anything away, but there's a scene that's very emotional for Laura. And I wrote it literally like four or five different ways. So in the first iteration, she has a panic attack. In the second iteration, um, she kind of is very cool and like, like self-possessed. And in the third version, she just like leaves what's happening and like goes in another room. Um, and I feel like there was a fourth version, but in the current version, she's physically present. She's kind of having this out of body experience because she just can't process like what's happening. So technically, like I just, I kept writing that scene and I was just like, it's just not landing. And so it took again, four or five tries to get it to land. Then there was a scene that was really difficult. There were a few scenes that were really difficult to write emotionally. And the one that's coming up for me right now is there's actually a piece where, um, this isn't giving away too much, but James, as we know, is an alcoholic. He struggles with alcoholism and he spends some time in prison. And it was really hard for me to write those scenes. It was really emotional to kind of like put myself in that place of how scared he is. Um, and of what happens while he's there, it was really, really challenging. And so I had to kind of create a system for myself of like, I would be like, okay, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write for one hour. And then I would have to kind of like take myself out and go for a walk and kind of like settle myself because it was really challenging emotionally to write that piece. Ooh, Teresa asks, what was the original title of your first draft? Teresa, I love this question. Okay. So the first draft of the book was called The Picture of Things because Laura is a photographer and there's a song by Bebo Norman called The Picture of Things um, and it's all about sort of like trying to get a picture of how things really are. And I thought it was kind of cool, but everyone who read it was like, this is a terrible title. <laughs> like you can't call it this. So, okay, fine. So the second title that I came up with was Edgewater which is actually the name of the street where Catherine lives. And I felt like that was closer, but like not quite it. And for a long time, I actually kept like waiting for the perfect title to appear. And I was like, it's just gonna come. I'm gonna be reading over the draft one day and it's just gonna like appear to me. 
that was not happening. And so finally what I did was I really liked the idea of tying in the photography in some way. And so I just started Googling, I just started researching different photographic terms and I came across the word catch light which is a photographic term. And it actually refers to when you're looking at a photograph, when you can see the light in someone's eye. So if it's a model, you can often see like the light they're using to, you know, light the shoot. Or if it's outside, you can often see like sunlight or reflected light in someone's eye. So I was like, that is the title. So catch light it became. Okay, Rita is asking, tell us about the cover. So yes, okay, so when it came time to design the cover, my publisher came to me and they were like, okay, like, do you have any concepts? And I told them I had two ideas. And one was a photograph of ocean because the ocean plays a huge part in the book. And actually the other concept idea that I offered was this idea of, um, having like a close up of a person's part of a person's face so that you could see the catch light in their eye. And they tried it both ways. And the one with the, the person, I hated it. And this was actually the first draft that they did. I was obsessed with the cover right away. I think the only change we made was moving my name. And literally first try, I was like, that's it. That's the cover. So I was thrilled with it from the beginning. All right, Iris asks, how long did it take to write the book from beginning to end? So with breaks and taking time off from it, I thought of the idea and worked through three complete drafts between 2007 and 2014. So it took seven years in total to write it and then six years to get it published. All right, Kimberly is asking, which story in your book are you most proud of? So it's one long continuous story and I'm trying to think of like what part I am most proud of. I think <clears throat> I will share two, two things. So one is I'm really proud of James's arc in the book and I've been told that um, just his storyline is really compelling and sort of the choices that he makes and where he ends up um, just show kind of how a character can make choices and and choose for themselves like what they're gonna do. So I'm really proud of that. I'm also really proud there's one particular scene where two of the characters, it's coming up on Christmas time, and two of the characters go to buy a Christmas tree together and they really have this beautiful moment where they see someone who knows that their mother is sick and who knows about something else that's been happening in their family. And they just have this beautiful moment, like standing in this tree lot, like in this like row of evergreen trees. And it's just a really beautiful scene that I'm really proud of. Okay, so Virginia asked, how did you come up with the name Catchlight? So I already shared that piece, which is so fun. Ooh, Marcia asks, okay, have you ever used your non-dominant hand for writing and drawing in order to tap into the emotions of your characters? So Marcia, I love this question so much because in my writing teaching, when I'm working with my students, I teach something, a process that I developed called embodied writing, which is all about getting into your body to tap into emotion. And we always handwrite. So I have not personally used non-dominant handwriting, but I know a lot of writers that have, and I'm curious to try it. So thank you for reminding me that that's something that I wanna try out because I've heard really cool things about what can come out when you're using your non-dominant hand. Okay, Cynthia asks, in the seriousness of Catherine's journey and the relationships between siblings, you use an element of humor which balances the scenes. Does that come naturally as you are writing or do you review and then add it in? So Cynthia is a friend of mine who has read an advanced copy of Catch Light so she knows that there is some humor and levity and I'm so glad you brought that up because um, I'm glad that it came through first of all and I'm glad that, um, that you're reminding me to talk about that. So I think there were certain things um, that I've just observed in my immediate family and in my extended family on both sides that like are just like little ticks that people use or like little interactions that like 
patterns that play out like every single time you see somebody or like interact with somebody. And so I did use those on purpose, like immediately just to like infuse some of that humor and like just some of that ridiculousness that is family life that can sometimes just like come through. Um, so in some cases it just sort of bubbled up like to bring some lightness to the scene. And in some places I did go back and say like, oh, okay, like we have a lot of more serious scenes in a row and I need kind of like a little bit of comedic break. And so I would like on purpose add something back in. So um, sometimes it happened in the moment and sometimes I had to go back and add it in. So let me see, I think I missed, okay, here we go. Um, Tiffany asks, what's been your favorite part of the publication process? Good question. So I loved getting to work on the cover. So I love being able to kind of give some different concepts and I just absolutely loved the cover that we came up with. And it's especially amazing to me because I am not, I am not very um, visually or like artistically, visual art artistically gifted. <laughs> So I'm like, I want a photo with the ocean. That's like the only thing that I can really like give you. And they came back with this and I was just so thrilled because it's sometimes hard for me to convey what I want something to look like. And so the fact that the designer came with this cover on the first try was just really exciting to me. Okay, so Mary asks, how did writing the book change your perspective of Alzheimer's? So I think that it really deepened um, my own empathy for others that are going through this journey, right? So spending so much of my time just creating a world where characters were dealing with this disease, um, it really just gave me so much more empathy for people who are going through that in real life. And I think there's also quite frankly, like a measure of my own sadness and anger at what the disease does to loved ones that I was able to like work out a little bit while I was writing. And so that was really helpful to me of again, using that artistic outlet to kind of work through some of that grief on my own part. Alrighty, okay, one more question. So Tiffany asks, did you have any specific music or songs for certain scenes? So this is so fun because I do, I do teach this now about using music to set a mood when you're writing and to kind of help with emotional tone. And I didn't do that a ton when I was working on Catchlight. I would say the closest thing I could say is that I did frequently listen to an Andrea Bocelli um, album while I was writing the book. And so there is this sense of like this sweeping, dramatic, like emotion, right, that he conveys so well with his music. And just as another like fun side note. So I once had someone tell me like, oh, but it's so important to have a really beautiful place where you can write. And yes, that is true. And also I wrote a lot of this book longhand in a spiral bound notebook sitting on the train commuting to my job. So I would be listening on my headphones to Andrea Bocelli and I'd be handwriting in a notebook because my laptop at the time weighed like 12 pounds and I couldn't carry it back and forth with me every day. So I would sit on the train, my commute was super long. It was almost two hours each way. So I would just sit and make notes. And at the end of the week, I would type all that stuff up. And, um, and that's, that's where I wrote a lot of Catchlight. But yes, Andrea Bocelli was kind of the music that I was listening to at the time. So, all right, that was a whole ton of questions. So drum roll, please. We're gonna move into giveaways. So I think I have been messaged some names. Yes, okay. So these are randomly chosen um, of all the participants who are on the call. And I've been so delighted to be here with you. So before I announce the giveaways, let me just remind you what the prize pack is and I'll tell you a little bit about how it's gonna work. So the prize pack is, an autographed copy, paperback copy of Catchlight, a custom Catchlight bookmark. You're gonna get a handwritten note from me, and you're also gonna get a mug from Kensington, so you'll be able to enjoy coffee or tea or another favorite beverage while you're reading. So the way this is gonna work is you will get an email tomorrow directly 
for, to you because we have your email address um, when they chose, randomly chose the winners. And you'll get an email from Anya asking for your mailing address. And then when the book releases on October 5th, I will send those over to her and Anya will mail out the prize packs. So get ready. The giveaways are going to, the winners are Virginia N Nayev or Nave, Brenda Moynihan, and Teresa Kramer. Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm so glad that I was able to share all this time with you and congratulations to our winners. So again, it's Virginia, Brenda, and Teresa. So Anya is going to get in touch with you tomorrow to get your mailing address so that we can send out the prize packs. And I just wanted to say that I know that you have a lot of demands for your time and attention, and I'm so grateful um, and appreciative that you shared a little of both with me. So I'm going to turn it over to Anya to close out our gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, everyone, for attending our Kensington exclusive book event with author Brooke Adams Law. We really hope that you found this event informative and worthwhile. Um, if you are interested in scheduling a tour with me uh, or purchasing Brooke's book, we will be sending out an email tomorrow um, with the link and uh, it will contain both my information and Brooke's link to, to purchase the book. Um, we were so thrilled that all of you attended and we had some great questions and Again, if anyone would like to schedule a tour with me, just send me an email. Uh, we are doing virtual tours at the moment, um, but I found a creative way where they're great um, and very informative. So again, Brooke, thank you so much, and um, we'll see you again.